cameras on. But, uh, in the meantime, I'm going to hand out some Also warn you, we have a uh, cup. Well, one very, very friendly kitty. <laughs> he might want to jump on your lap. <laughs> okay, let me see if we're ready. Austin, we ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Um, my name is Gary Matsuoka, Laguna Hills Nursery. Thanks for coming here. I have to give a better introduction since we're on YouTube. <laughs> so anyway, um, today we're talking about figs and pomegranates, which have been in cultivation by humans for at least 5,000 years, I think both of them. So both figs and pomegranates apparently originated in Asia. Uh, the center for pomegranates nowadays, the center of, I don't know, production seems to be Turkey. Uh, figs not much further, you know, a little further west than that, maybe Greece, Italy, really heavy into the figs, although figs are now taken off all around the world. So we'll start with the figs. Uh, figs are kind of unique to the Mediterranean climate. They don't like rain in the summer. So that's the one downfall with them. Um, we have a customer who actually is, lives here part of the year, lives part of the year in the Philippines. So it's a tropical monsoonal climate where they get rain all summer. And he's taken some figs of ours back to the Philippines. He said in the Philippines, they produce year round. But every now and then the monsoon will be so bad, they get all diseased and they die. So he's got to take new ones every few years to the Philippines because the rain kills them, absolutely kills them. So if you get a rainstorm on a fig that's fully leafed out, we get either rust or, or some kind of spotting going on in the leaves. And then the leaves drop off and then they grow new ones, of course. Uh, but if it continues raining, they have trouble getting going. So uh, figs like our climate, which is the dry summer climate. So, now we've had a few years, you know, back 2013, 2014, 2015, very little rain, winter was very warm, several of the fig varieties never stopped producing fruit. They fruited year round. So they are capable of that if we have uh, incredibly warm winters. But, uh, it, you know, this year was more normal. It may get cooler and cooler the next few years back to, uh, you know, stay normal weather where they don't produce at all. So on figs, they are, there are two crops that are recognized. And uh, on this particular tree, you see one fruit. I don't know if you can see it in the back there. Let me turn this around. There's one fruit forming right here that's much larger than the other figs that are forming among the leaves that are real small. Well, this is the brebra crop. So on figs, brebba is a spring crop. Most fig trees do not make many on the brebba crop, but the figs are very large. They're larger than the regular crop figs, and usually they are very good quality also. And all these figs are, this fig, it's forming on last year's wood. So as, you know, generally with figs, every leaf they, they create has a fig attached to it. Uh, especially in the summer and the fall. Well, late in the fall, they don't have time to develop those fruit. The fruit are real tiny, they hang on through the winter, and then they develop the following spring. And that's your brebber crop. So never very many, but they can be really, really good fruit. And then the regular crop, all the leaves that are growing during warm weather this year will have a little fig developing at their base. They start ripening in summer and go all the way into, uh, they can get close to winter also. Now, some fig varieties don't fruit that long into, into the fall, but most of them have a good long, you know, August, September, October into November crop. So that's one good thing we like about figs is they can fruit 
for a long, long period of time. You know, like, I mean, it's almost ideal for a, a small tree in that they fruit, you know, on each branch maybe one every two days. So you can, you, you know, you don't get 500 figs at one time. You get two or three a day. So, so which, is, which is the good thing about figs is they keep production. Now, um, they do like, you know, the best quality f fruit, full sun. They will fruit in full shade because I've tried it. I put fig trees underneath other trees in the shade just to see how well they did. Same number of figs, absolutely no taste. So the more sun you have, the better the flavor. So figure on half a day of sun for decent flavor, full day of sun for best flavor. Uh, a few hours of sun, you'll still get fruit. This is maybe not very good fruit. So. And the other thing about figs is they're pretty good in containers. Um, they fruit from generally from the first year. So even if you get a brand new fig tree, and they, they're grown from cuttings, uh, generally they're not grafted. Uh, you take a piece of stem that's between one and three years old, and you stick it in some clean dirt, it grows. It grows. That's why figs are among the oldest cultivated things, because all the man had to do was take a branch off the tree, take it with him, and stick it in the ground wherever he settled down, and there they would grow and start producing fruit. Um, now, generally, we take these cuttings in the winter, and then they grow like this by spring, and then by summer, they can be this tall, and by fall, they can be this tall, and by winter, they can be over your head. We've seen some figs grow from cuttings uh, 10 feet in one ear. So they can certainly grow fast. Um, now, they're not bad in containers. This has been in this pot about four years. Figure four, five to ten years in a pot this size. Uh, what happens is they start growing shorter and shorter branches because they're getting root bound. And of course, the less they grow, the less fruit they make. So what we usually tell people, this is not a bad size. This is a 15, con considered a 15-gallon container, <clears throat> 15 inches wide, 18 inches tall. Of course, you, there are many pots about the same size. But it may be better just every five years to start a new plant than to try to keep this one going in the same pot. Like My father was a bonsai artist, and in bonsai, you keep the same plant in the same pot for hundreds of years. Of course, they don't live that long. I mean, people don't live that long, but someone usually picks up the plant and takes care of it. And what they do is every 10 years at a minimum, that there are some plants that require it every couple years, but they take the plant out of the pot, cut off half the soil, uh, try not to cut through too many healthy roots, and replace that dirt. This the soil in a pot gets filled with too many old roots don't function anymore so you need to keep adding more soil for uh, new you know for a new space for the roots to grow so the plant can remain healthy and grow but in the case of figs it may not be worth the trouble to redo the same plant it may be just a lot easier to restart a new one you know keep the plant for the year you're starting the new one then by the next year the new plant will be in full production and away you go for another five years now, just so you know, um, on the internet you see questions about sources of figs having viruses. Well, pretty much all figs have viruses. So there's a fig mosaic virus that causes, you see this mottled color on this leaf. Um, a fig virus causes that. Now. It is possible to get the viruses out of figs by putting them in a, a heated environment for like three or four days. They've done that with all the roses. So roses get a similar mosaic leaf virus. And what they did in the 1980s and 90s was they took all the roses, put them in a hot chamber, which gave them essentially a fever. Just like when you want to cure your own viruses, you get a fever. 104 degrees for 72 hours if the plant doesn't die from that the plant is usually cured from the virus. The problem with figs is they catch the virus again real easily. Whereas roses do not catch the virus from any transmitting way except for grafting. 
So rose viruses are only transmittable from direct contact to a diseased plant. The fig virus, a little mite spreads it. And the mites float around the wind, so you can clean them up of a virus and they get it back again within a few years. So it's, it's not practical to get rid of the viruses. They do stunt the growth of them during cool conditions. So by the time you get to summer and you get a 9 degree day, viruses disappear. They don't like the heat. So, um, so we don't worry about them too much, but you'll see them during cool weather or if the plant's in uh, unhealthy conditions like bad potting soil. Usually it's bad potting soil. You see it all the time. So, um, so when we grow them, we don't see it that often because we use really good potting soil here. A lot of the fig viruses are, I mean, the fig cultivars, the varieties of figs that we grow are really old. I mean, the black mission fig, which is the one most common in Southern California, was brought here in the 1700s from Spain, spread through the missions. And so that's the most popular one you see, and still quite good. A lot of people still like that the best. Um, now, the way we want to keep so we, you can see this tree, it's been pruned a lot. So there are ways to keep figs small and productive. So the average fig tree wants to grow 20 to 30 feet. We don't want it that tall. You can't reach the fruit. So what we do on figs, what we know to do is that most of them, well, pretty much all of them, make fruit on new growth coming off of one-year-old branches. So this is a second year plant. This branch grew last year up to about here and this year it's growing these branches from that branch and they're making fruit. So you can cut it, This all this branch grew last year, so you can cut it here, 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 all the way down to the bottom where it started and it'll still make branches that grow fruit. If you cut it to a real old part of this thing, right, in fact you can cut this down to the dirt, it'll re-sprout from the underground parts of the stem but it won't make fruit for one year. So they can make fruit off of wood that's one year old. Cage, well, they actually can make fruit off of wood that's two years old too. So this is one year old wood. Um, this is one, oh, most of this is one year old wood that they're growing off of. This trunk here is probably three years old. So if we cut it down here, it'll still grow out of the nodes of this trunk, but they won't have fruit for one year. So, you can cut off, you know, most fig orchards that have the bigger growing figs, they'll cut them down, you know, to about one or two nodes. Each, each leaf is a node, makes a node. So they'll cut it down to within one or two nodes of where that branch started every winter. So when you see an old fig orchard in the wintertime, they've got these stumps in the ground that are massive with slender one-year-old stems sticking out of it where they cut it down to. And then during that, during the, the current year, these will grow, say, six to ten feet and have figs on them. And then the next winter, they'll cut them down, leaving one or two nodes with just a few inches of growth on each stem so this thing doesn't get too tall on them. Now, there are a number of dwarf figs that you don't have to cut that severely. Now if you cut off all these ends, you won't get your spring crop because all the brebba crop that forms in the spring would be at the tips. But on most fig trees, you'll get some branching down here that are real short. So you just leave those alone. You'll get some figs on them in the spring. And the long stems, just cut them back unless you like climbing ladders is they can get big. Now, as far, the other part of figs is they, they're they really easy going about soil. So almost any soil, any almost any potting soil, you can grow a fig in, even the bad potting soils, they'll make it. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the ground at your house, clay, sand, it doesn't seem to matter, rock. They seem to be able to handle just about anything. The only thing to be careful with is an area that stays boggy in the winter. I don't think they like to be real wet in the winter time when it rains. But other than that, they're they're pretty easy going. They have a real powerful um, 
roots that can pull water out of nearly dry soil. So you certainly see a lot of figs growing in abandoned yards. Now, most of the figs of the world were discovered by chance seedlings. So uh, now, okay, I should go back a little bit. So there's different kind of figs out there. Uh, what we grow is a, a, a sterile, well, it's a self-fruiting female plant. So all the fruiting figs out there for that we sell are self-fruiting females. They do not need pollination. They don't need a male around. Uh, there's one famous fig, and perhaps the most famous fig in the world, is called the Smyrna fig. If you go down to Trader Joe's uh, and get these dried figs, these are called Calamyrna, which is short for California-grown Smyrna figs from Portugal. So uh, the Smyrna fig in Europe or P Spain, Portugal, is considered some of the finest figs in the world. They're light-colored. They dry light. They do have some interesting crunchy seeds. They're not hard seeds, but they're crunchy. So that's considered about the top fig, especially for drying purposes. When they, when California wanted to grow these, they went to Portugal and got the cuttings for the trees. The uh, farmers in Portugal didn't tell them they needed to pollinate the thing. So for about five years, they wondered what's going on on our farms. We're not, you know, the, the little fruits are forming, but they're just dropping off. And then they went back to Portugal, and the guys admitted, yeah, you have to have another orchard to grow the wasp. So there's another kind of fig that we don't eat uh, called a capra fig. And this fig would have male and female parts in it. So besides just the fleshy part of the fruit, So this is a rubber crop off of a fig at our growing grounds. So a regular female only fig looks like this inside. It's all kind of, I don't know, figs are related to mulberries. So it's just the berries inside the shell that you see in a female fig that we normally eat. But the capper figs would also have the male stamens in there which are very feathery and not pleasant to eat. So the capper figs, they need and a wasp lives in the capra figs. The, um, the baby wasps are little white maggot-like creatures and they eat the pollen and inside the capra fig. And then the male wasps fly out of there looking for females to mate with, carrying the pollen of the capra fruit with them. So the Smyrna figs are in an orchard nearby and they know that they need to put about uh, I think it's nine capra figs in a basket below the each Smyrna fig tree to get the right number of wasps flying out of there to pollinate the Smyrna figs. Um, if you have too many wasps, too much pollination, the fruit bursts open, too much flesh inside. So they say they know that only nine figs underneath each tree with the capra wasp in there. So apparently in these figs that I'm eating, there are some remnants sometimes of wasps. The male wasps are in there pollinating, trying to, f they're pollinating the female parts of this flower. There's no male parts in here. There's no females to mate with, but apparently they leave wings and pieces of themselves behind as they do their work and die, and then they often die in there too. So uh, anyway, a little extra protein in Smyrna figs. So when you grow figs now, a lot of people have told me over there they get volunteer figs. So volunteer figs coming up out of the ground from seeds of these figs come up all over the place. Birds eat them. They poop the seeds. They sprout up along the fence lines. Um, so one person, this was back in the 1980s, told me that their, their figs didn't taste very good. So I said, well, bring them in. I'll check them out. So I cut them in half. And I looked at them for a while, and the entire inside of the fig was moving. So they had a capra fig with a little wasp larvae in there, so they didn't taste very good. So I said, I told them, well, you don't want to eat this. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so whenever I, and I've grown about half a dozen volunteer figs, or let them grow, and it takes them a long time to become adult and make fruit. 
maybe five years after they sprout from the ground. And I've got about half of them that I've grown turn out to be caprifix with the male parts in there, so they were not really, I didn't even try to eat them. And the other half turned out to be females, but I made sure there was nothing moving before I, I took a bite. And uh, one out of three that I got from the seedlings was really good. So, and we do sell it. Um, it's got a little bit of a following. So Gary Strawberry Fig came up in my yard. And the first year it made fruit, it wasn't all that great. I thought, oh, it's okay. Second year and third year, it got better and better tasting. And this fig turns out to be a, a bell-shaped fruit. Uh, good size, not huge, but a good size. Um, it's got a... One thing about figs that we like, okay, so some of the characteristics of figs. So they usually have this opening, I think it's called austil or something, where the bugs can get in there to pollinate. Um, the better figs have a very tight opening, no bugs can get in there. Some of the other figs have really large openings and everything gets into that fig before it ripens. Um, like one of our favorite figs, which is the panache, which is a striped fig, has a real big opening on it. And although in many areas it's not a problem, if you're, especially if you're by the coast, a fig with an open eye and the humidity near the coast, sometimes it gets moldy in there and it all tastes like sour, it's all very sour before it ever ripens. So the <clears throat> open eye can be a problem. So it's nice to have a fig with a nice tight eye. And the other thing about the larger figs is most of the larger figs, the skin won't stretch enough to hold the meat, and they split when they ripen, which invites a lot of bugs to eat them too, and birds. So it's ideal if the fig doesn't split ever. Sometimes the skin can crack, but if it splits open, then all the bugs start coming in. So it's nice to have a fig that doesn't have an, a big eye. It's nice to have a fig that doesn't split open when it's ripe. And the Gary's strawberry fig is one of those... Uh, it's got a, a nice tight eye, it doesn't ever split open, plus it's got bright red flesh and a real strong berry flavor. Now figs, uh, there's kind of two ways to go on figs flavor-wise. There's the real mellow sweet figs, and, then you, and some of those are really juicy. And then there's the firmer uh, figs with a stronger berry flavor. And Gary Strawberry would be definitely one of the berry-flavored figs, um, which means it's got more acidity to it, uh, more, you know, to me a more interesting flavor. Although I like a lot of the real sweet figs also. So, but anyway, now I don't push my own fig that much because there's another fig already in the trade that's very similar. So, apparently, it's a common design of fig to have. The red flesh, this bear, strong berry flavor, and the green skin. We actually uh, push into a different one. We'll go over that in a second. That has the same characteristics. Anyway, so you don't like them to split too much. Tight eye. Those are ideal. Um, a few figs don't get the spring crop, and another few figs only get the spring crop, don't get the fall crop. Uh, we don't like that one. Now, a lot of figs have trouble... You know, there's some really good figs that have trouble ripening in our climate because we're not quite Mediterranean enough. So the true Mediterranean climate would be like Fresno, where it's nice and hot every day of the summer and dry. Generally, they don't get the summer rains at all. Um, we have some trouble with several figs in this area ripening properly. Interestingly, there are more of the yellow, t the light-colored figs but uh, some figs, if the weather is cloudy like this too much uh, and not hot, then the fruit never develops properly. I, uh, we have a customer from the cent Central Valley near Fresno, and he says all the figs do well there. They all do fine. So that's their climate, more dry, intense heat in the summertime, uh, not so much coastal influence. So we do have to pick our figs a little more carefully here. So we've, you know, we've discarded some figs along the way that uh, keep failing to, to, to ripen here. <coughs> uh, as far as pest goes, not a whole lot to worry about. Uh, one thing we have come across, nematodes. 
So nematodes are microscopic worms, and they what they do is they cause the roots to get all knotted up. The roots look like strings of cottage cheese. The tree barely grows, barely produces. Um, this happens on sandy soil. So if you've got a fig that's just not flourishing, is just kind of sitting around, not doing anything, dig the roots up and check them. If they have, look like strings of cottage cheese all knotted up, you've got nematode problems. Now, we have a beneficial nematode in our refrigerator that says it controls the root rot nematode. It apparently as a predator on that one, but we've cured it in the past. Now, I've never seen this written, so I don't know if it's, because I've not done the re you know, some real good research on it, but we know that the cool season grasses, ryegrass, fescue grass, bluegrass, are immune to nematodes because the roots put out poisons that kill them. So whenever I've had nematodes in the roots of trees, I've had them on figs, I've had them on bananas, I've had them on white sapote. Uh, I just planted some ryegrass around the tree, let it grow for three months, dig up the dirt, don't see any more knots. So that's what we've been doing to control root, root knot nematodes. Um, I have not seen that as an official way to control them, but it seems to work. Ryegrass seeds sprout in two to three days. Um, and let them grow for maybe three months and then just peel it off like a strip of sod and you got rid of it. So, um, anyway, if that happens, that's, that's what I would recommend. Occasionally they get scale. Now, if you have ants climbing all over a tree, they'll bring scale insects up there. So control the ants. We have some good ant controls. If you do have scale on your tree, hit them with an oil spray that's, you know, organic control. Um, smother them with the oil. The biggest problem we have, of course, is birds, rats, possums that like to eat the fruit. Um, my, back in the 80s, I had 20 fig trees in my back and side yard, and it was like an aviary every, say, August, September. <laughs> it was just a total mess. And then I heard about birds li not liking snakes, so I went to Disneyland and bought a realistic rattlesnake and hung it in the tree that was about this big. Did not hear a bird for two weeks. Did not see a bird for two. They were they didn't like that at all. So now they do make a blow-up version. Not quite as realistic as the one I had from Disneyland, but uh, this one is, uh, if you hang it in your tree, you might keep your neighbors out of your yard too. But uh, the birds do get used to it after a while. It's nice to keep moving around the, the yard so they can't, they think it's alive. But this will make a, it's supposed to be a six foot snake blown up. Um, you could cover it with bird netting, but the problem with figs is they grow so fast. I tried bird, that bird netting was the first thing I tried. Put it over the fig tree. Within a week, I couldn't get the netting off anymore because it grows right through the little openings. So you'd have, almost have to keep your fig tree small and make a frame that goes over the fig tree to keep the birds away from it. Or, or, you know, make a little uh, hut out of uh, chicken wire and grow the fig inside that. And that would work that way, too. Uh, the other thing that we have for birds is this bird scare tape. If you go to Napa Valley, they use this all over the place when the grapes are ripening. So they string this horizontally between branches or on the, in the grape grown regions. They sp string it between the stakes. And they put a slight twist in this. It's silver on one side and red on the other. Any kind of breeze at all, that tape slowly uh, twists back and forth in the breeze. And the red and the silver streak like 100 miles an hour across the field. That Those lines are just streaking back and forth because the thing's flipping over. So pretty interesting way to scare birds off. This works about two weeks, too. So you just have to keep using different methods to keep the birds away. And if you pick your figs, you know, if you don't, and if you're, if you're good about being out there and pick all the ripe ones, then they never discover it. But if you let a few ripe and then you're in trouble. Now there's a fig beetle too that we get called the, uh, well, it's green fig beetle, uh, green fruit beetle. Uh, it eats anything sweet. They'll eat figs, they'll eat peaches, they'll eat rosebuds. Um, that one, again, if you keep your ripe figs picked regularly, you won't 
you know, they won't find it, but once they find it, it's kind of a mess. Fortunately, they don't, the big green beetles don't fly very well. You can just catch them in your hand. Now, they're real strong. They can actually work their way out of your palm. They don't bite. They can't bite you anyway. They can bite the figs. Um, sometimes they'll get a plastic bag, cover the branch, just knock them in the bag, and then tie them up and throw them in the trash. Um, I know you can tie strings to them and fly them around for a while. They're, they're pretty big beetles. So that's your main pest. If you have rats and mice, uh, we usually say bubble gum's the first method to try to control them. You won't get all of them, but you'll get a lot of them. Uh, just put unwrapped bubble gum where your dog can't reach it, you know, on the wall somewhere, and they eat it. It doesn't digest. It does kill them. A lot of them doesn't kill all of them, but but they're non-toxic way of doing it. Um, we usually pull out the rat traps next, rat and mice traps. Um, see if we can get them that way. So those are the predators. Yes. Unwrap, don't unwrap. Oh, we were unwrap it and just set it on somewhere where they can find it. Unfortunately, we haven't seen the control squirrels with it. We wish squirrels would eat it because uh, they can be a real problematic too. A lot of the same controls go for pomegranate fruit also. So, Okay. Um, Fertilizer-wise, none of these are very picky. So just a good all-purpose fertilizer. It doesn't even have to be a fruit tree fertilizer. They're not, I don't know, at my own house in the ground, I just don't fertilize them. Usually they pick it up somewhere. In pots, you do have to feed them. They don't have any other source of nutrition. They can't find it since they're in a pot. But in the ground, they seem to be able to find everything they need. So. Okay, I think... Yes. Um, no, they grow in abandoned yards, so it's not critical, but even watering is best. So try to water, you know, if you want the best figs possible, any commercial crop, fruit tree wise, you want to keep the soil moist about a foot to foot and a half deep. Uh, and the only way you can tell that, because looking at the surface, you just don't know how deep the moisture is. So you get a piece of rebar about the thickness of this rod and you see how far you can stick it down next to your tree where you're watering it if you can push it in there about a foot you're good if you only push it in six inches your fruits gonna be smaller than normal and one problem with if you let the soil go wet dry wet dry your fruit tends to split a lot easier so try to maintain you know if you're gonna maintain it it's easier to maintain it wet than to go dry because then if you water it everything <laughs> tends to split on you because it when you water th fruit they tend to absorb water too fast and a lot of times faster than the skin can stretch so it splits them right open I used to have a fig in my house that looked like someone filleted just looked like a flower out there because they would just break right open every time I watered it. the problem I had with that tree was right next to a, my neighbor's big tree so the neighbor's tree would dry out my yard pretty much every day then I'd water it and then it would dry out and water it and that fig just kept on splitting in that location because of the wet dry cycle on it so better to keep moist than too dry or just monitor your watering real carefully try to keep it even as there you know they are fairly drought tolerant plants mm-hmm Winter's the best. Um, you can certainly prune it during the year too. We, I haven't checked them enough. I would assume that if I cut this branch here right now, whatever branch will grow out, it will still have figs because it's coming off this branch. Well, it's not coming off an old branch. It's coming off an existing branch. But I don't. I I haven't played with them enough to tie that. I've usually just pruned them in the winter. So. But a friend of mine is going to be cutting his several times this year, so he'll, he'll let me know. <laughs> I don't have a fig at my current house that we can play with that much. Okay, um, generally we pick the fruit when it sags. So the best time to pick them, so these fruit are still being held fairly erect, and when they kind of sag down, 
uh, when they're full grown, that's when you know they're ripe. They often change a little bit on their color too. So the fruit on figs can be anywhere from near black to uh, to uh, almost cream colored. They, there's quite a bit of range in there. And generally, the darker figs generally have stronger flavor, and the and the lighter colored figs have the milder, sweeter flavor. So now the list I gave you. We started this year with over 30 varieties of figs. Um, just a few years ago, there was really only about 10 popular figs out there that, in the commercial side of things, um, just in the last few years, well, maybe the last five, six years, with the internet and all that, people have been bringing figs. You know, uh, well, back in the 80s, I had a friend who lived a few blocks from the nursery, Antonio from Genoa, Italy. And he had brought figs from his hometown in Italy, which is not legal, but back in those days, he came to the U.S., I think, in the 50s or 40s. So he brought f branches of his hometown figs with him. And he had collected about, I think, about 40 varieties of figs. And so I was trying some of the ones from his hometown. They were pretty good. Um, fortunately, he died before I can make much of a collection of his trees, but he certainly... Uh, it was one of the first fig collectors that I know of, but nowadays uh, people are sending fig branches from all over the world to people in the U.S., and we're getting to try all the different figs. So um, the variety of figs we have now is incredible. We're trying to still trying to figure out if the fig cuttings we're getting from collectors are true to type. So a lot of these that we got in that we're selling, we're not certain yet because we haven't seen them, especially a few of these we just got this winter from fig collectors so hopefully the fig turns out the way it's supposed to be now fortunately we you know in the past few years we've had figs that we knew were mislabeled like black ischia the fruit was green and brown it's like okay this isn't the right fig still really good <laughs> you know so they hate to throw it away so they got sent uh, uh, branches from a tree that are probably some type of ischia fig or ischia fig from uh, the Soviet Union, but or from Russia, but it wasn't the right one. But it looked just like the green issue with a little brown on it, so there must be different issue of figs out there. Um, but yeah, you know, we don't want to sell the wrong fig tree, so we threw those away. So we'll see what we come up with the next few years. Try to get all the varieties straight. Now again, the. <clears throat> The original fig in California was the Black Mission. And generally, uh, a firm fig, nearly black. The size on this tree can range from big to little. So the first fruit you get on Black Mission, tends, the spring crop, the berber crop, tends to be that big. It tends to be really big. And then as the year goes on, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller. And by December, January, the last few figs on the tree, they'll be about as big as your finger. <laughs> you know, they'll be real small. But they're all good. They're good fruit. So it's a firm, uh, got red flesh in there, quite a bit berry flavor. Now, there is another fig tree. Now, this thing can grow 20 foot plus. That's the problem with it. But there's another fig tree that's very similar to it called Violet de Bordeaux. I might be out of this one now. I th or might have some more out there. But Valle de Bordeaux, the figs look pretty much identical, although they tend to be a little smaller. The leaves look identical, but the plant only grows about six feet, <coughs> maybe a little bigger. So that seems to be a miniature version of the Black Mission. So if you have a pot on a patio, well, even pots tend to stunt trees anyway. So it's even a black mission fig in a pot is not that much of a problem. In the ground, though, black mission just gets huge. <clears throat> but the violet stays pretty small. Now, the other popular fig a long time ago was brown turkey. We don't. We might have one or two out there. Totally different fig. Lighter purple, maybe a little green sometimes. Wider fig. This one is the one that tends to be juicy, sweet, tends to split. Um, 
trees tend to grow about 10 feet plus. But what the literature has said about brown turkey, it's one of the figs from Italy. And there's hundreds of figs from Italy that look alike. So one that we do sell is called, uh, we, name, we call it Italian Everbearing. But it may be a brown turkey. It may be something else. But it looks the same. I mean, it's, it's another pretty much bell-shaped fruit. Uh, on the internet, when we looked, tried to figure out the name of it, because I was given it by an Italian family back in the 1980s. They didn't have a name for it. It says, this is our family heirloom. It looked enough like brown turkey, but not quite like the brown turkeys we had. So looked on there, it looked like the one called Italian Everbearing from Dave Wilson. I brought in some of those. They looked the same. But they did say that there may be a, a whole bunch of figs in the United States, all with different names that are exactly the same fig. So you just don't know. And then we have another fig out there, I-258, which is one of the Italian, you know, I don't know, I think there's I-500, you know, there's like a lot of them. They just gave letters and numbers to them from Italy. And I-258 was one they picked out to be pretty darn good. And I would have to say another simmer fig as far as we've eaten is uh, this one from France. This was real popular in uh, England. Seems to be the same type of fruit. Um, wide bell-shaped fruit, mostly light purplish, brownish color, sweet and juicy. Uh, of all these, I don't know, I almost find this one to be the best tasting one, but a lot of it is, happens to do with where the plant's located, sun-wise, how we take care of it. So it's hard to say if which one of these is best. And again, they may all be identical. So, so those are all kind of similar, large, juicy figs. Now, University of California, they said worked for 60 years to create this one. So this is Sequoia. They did another one too called Sierra, and Sierra and Sequoia were two figs that they developed to take the place of the Smyrna fig because the Smyrna needs that second orchard to pollinate it. Um, it has to be not in the same vicinity as the orchard they're pollinating to keep the wasp, you know, keep the female wasp away. But Sequoia and Sierra uh, took them a long time to get, to get a fig that's light colored. Uh, bell shape that'll dry fairly light um, and they also wanted to retain the crunchy seeds that the Smyrna has and both of these are pretty darn good. They said Sierra may be better uh, for commercial use. It seems to have the lighter, uh, real light colored skin and flesh for drying purposes but for homeowners they're saying Sierra is be Sequoia is better, it's a smaller tree. Um, but I, it's real interesting, the fruit on that, you, can, you know, when you're, you can't fill the seeds, but you can hear them in your ear, just like Rice Krispies, kind of crunching. So I like that fig. It's pretty good. Now, one of the figs that they developed along the way that didn't fit their criteria was Flanders. And Flanders is the one that is very much like my Gary Strawberry fig. So Flanders is a, like Gary Strawberry, full-size tree. The main difference between this fig and my fig, because they taste very similar. They got the bright red flesh. They have olive green skin with purple veining. Uh, closed dye. Uh, don't split. Flanders is a little different shape. So it's more of a this shape fig. And then Gary Strawberry is more of a bell-shaped fig. But neither one splits. They 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 grow the same. They the only reason the reason why I like to promote Flanders better is a much older variety. So this was developed, I believe, in the 50s or 60s, and um, released to the public in the 1980s. So we got it then. So it's about 30 years older than Gary Strawberry Fig, 
And when they get older, when the variety is older and they're propagating it, the babies tend to produce fruit sooner. So my Gary strawberry is maybe 10 years old now from the original seedling. And because of that, it still shows a lot of the baby qualities where the leaves are rarely deeply cut like snowflakes. And sometimes they don't fruit the first year or the second year. They seem to take a while to become mature again after you take cuttings. Now, the further away you get from the original plant, like I don't own the house where the original plant is anymore, so we're taking cuttings off of cuttings. The further away you get from it propagation-wise, the sooner the babies produce the more precocious they become and the less uh, quick growing they become. So, um, you know, after a few more years, maybe it'll become just as reliable producer real fast as the Flanders. But right now, I would say between the two, I'd go with Flanders because it's definitely a, a, a heavy producer the first year. Okay, so that's stuff from University of California. Um, LSU down, you know, Louisiana State University developed their own LSU Purple, which is a pretty famous fig. I've got a number of those around. Um, I guess I didn't bring one in. So that one is a dark flesh fig that's meant to handle the humidity and the rain in uh, Louisiana. So that, that can have some advantages here, too, because of our humidity near the coast. So I'll see you purple. I haven't eaten enough. I've only eaten one year of, you know, sometimes the first year of a fig tree's production, the quality isn't quite there yet. It takes a few years for the trees to really get into making good quality fruit. So I don't know that one real well yet. And we have a lot of them I don't really know well, real well yet. Now, one that we wanted to try was this white Marseille, also known as Laterula, but white Marseille which was Thomas Jefferson's favorite fig that he brought from France to Virginia in the 1700s. Also handles humidity and rain better. So we'll see how well this one does. And it's a light colored fig. And one last one that I, well, another one I really like. Uh, I, I hadn't seen this for 20 years, and one of our former customers, our customers brought it to me because I sold this in the 1980s called Mary Lane. Uh, its proper name is probably Mary Lane Seedless, but it's a very chartreuse colored fig. Kind of a real, most light colored figs are more tannish or greenish. This one's definitely on the yellow side when you see it. So we do like that one too. Uh, Mary Lane. If you like yellow figs, I mean, that's pretty much quite yellow, Mary Lane. We have another one up there called Italian Grandmother. Now this one's not officially registered on that name, but um, a good friend of mine who's Greek, or who's Greek heritage, married an Italian woman. That was his first wife a couple wives ago. But anyway, her grandmother had brought from Italy uh, a nice yellow fig that has a nice bell shape to it. Uh, I would have to say that's the best yellow fig I've eaten so far. So we do sell it because it is quite good of a yellow fig and it, and it keeps this tree about five feet so it's not too, too vigorous. But as far as yellow figs goes, I don't know, Mary Lane was real good, Italian grandmother. There's a real famous one, I can't remember where it's from though, yellow long neck. That's real impressive fruit. But this one does have trouble ripening in this weather. I mean, our plant last year, I mean, the fruit on this one are impressive because they look like that. Real big base with the long neck on it. Uh, fairly yellow, uh, real good when we have consistently warm weather, but you get a few weeks of a week of this weather like this and you lose a whole bunch of fruit. They just don't ripen well. In fact, another one that we, we've officially quit carrying, although there's still a few around, Peter's Honey, 
which is real famous on the internet. I don't know why, because it's a terrible fig for us. But Peter's honey, and even on the web on the literature that says you have to have warm conditions to ripen that properly. So don't grow it too close to the ocean. Well, apparently we're too close to the ocean here, because we have trouble getting this thing to ripen. It just gets moldy and rots on the plant. So don't get this one. Yellow long neck's not as. Now, if you live inland another few miles, maybe, but closer to the ocean, I would stay away from these two. They're not, they seem to not ripen well when we have that weather. For the same reason we haven't carried white genoa for a long time. We used to lose our crops in white genoa every summer, even though, that, even though that's recommended for the coastline. It's, I think it would have to be an area of, of the world where it's not cloudy near the coast when they're ripening, because we couldn't get any of our white genoas not to get that mold, that sour mold in them. They would just come down with it. Now, one another interesting fig that we do carry that I have a lot of this year because I like it. Col de Dom Noir. Uh, if I don't have the label on it, we just have the initial CDDN. But Col de Dom is a series of figs from uh, it, uh, France. Col de Dom means collar of a woman's dress. And uh, the figs are, I don't know, they're, they said the shape reminds them of a, of a formal dress. part. Uh, but anyway, bald gown or something. But noir means dark. So it's got, I don't know, it's one of the few really unique figs I've eaten that didn't look edible. <laughs> you know? It's a blackish fig, and I, I, I split it open to check the inside. It looks totally rotten, like it's fermenting in there. And it's not. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. So it's real different. I thought it was one of the more unique figs that I had tried. Of course, this tiger fig that I mentioned first, the panache, is a lot of people's favorite. But it does have the open eye, and we have lost the entire crop when we have overcast summers. Now this is one of the figs that doesn't make a spring crop at all. It, it tries. I mean, we've seen figs on these trees that were trying to develop, but they never quite ripen. They would just fail. Uh, so this is a summer crop coming on. But uh, it is a lot of people's favorite. It, it does have really brilliant red flesh, maybe the reddest flesh I've seen of all the figs. And it does have a very strong cherry flavor to it. So it's one of the few figs my wife has liked. She doesn't like figs. But she liked this one because it actually has a very strong cherry flavor to it. But again, you have to watch it near the coast. I lived in Mission Vale when I had this tree. And about every third year, I'd lose the entire crop to mold. But I uh, love the years when it was good. So we do have a number of other figs out there that are on your list, uh, but you know these are some of our better known ones. Any questions on figs? There's one other bug that sometimes gets on figs. It's called a uh, rust mite. So if you're if it's not raining and your leaves start getting this brownish tint to them in the summertime, sometimes you get this microscopic mite. You can see it with a, a 20 power jeweler's loop to look at it, or a 40 power microscope. Uh, little tiny mites, and then so usually every summer I hit my trees with an oil spray just to make sure that they don't come down with that because if they do you lose a lot of foliage, so the neem seed oil or regular horticultural oil of some sort, uh, hit them with that. Now, in my yard, I've never had to do it. It's just this and appear there, but um, but if you have a lot of fig trees and you have a fig collection, you might want to do that once in a while just to make sure that the mites aren't getting a foothold. Okay, pomegranate trees. 
So pomegranates uh, apparently evolved, they claim, in India. And most of the pomegranates we grow, grow are from northern India. So they, it's cooler there, it's climate similar to here. They go to sleep in the wintertime. Um, of course, India has the monsoon climate, so they don't mind water on the leaves. So that's not a big issue. Uh, pomegranates are generally partially self-fertile. So this is the... The original popular pomegranate in the U.S. was the wonderful pomegranate discovered or bred in Florida back around 1900, somewhere around there. So for like 100 years, it was kind of exclusive. <laughs> um, there, to, you know, it does have, you know, you, if you know pomegranates from the store, they got the red skin, the red meat, they call them arils, the seeds surrounded by little flesh. It's, it's sweet and tart, it's definitely tart, uh, and the seeds are hard. You can chew them or eat them, but they're hard. Um, in the last, well, back in the 50s, 60s, they're developing, they're finding, selecting varieties or cultivars that have softer seeds. Uh, most of those were um, light colored flesh and not as strongly flavored. So we had things come around called Sweet, Eversweet, um, and a few others, Utah Sweet, light flesh, soft seeds. Uh, at that time, Eversweet was considered the top tasting one back in the 80s. Now, what was going on on the other side of the world? So the center of the fig world was Turkey. There was a fig collector in Russia operating uh, under the government, and he was collecting pomegranates throughout that region of the world. Um, Greg Levin, Dr. Greg Levin. And he was collecting for like 40 years. So all the best figs from that area of the world he was collecting. As Russia was falling apart in the 1980s, he was calling up all the other world universities of the world trying to get, get homes for his trees because they didn't have funding. The orchard was going downhill. It was dying off. They lost their water supply. Everything was going on. So he was sending cuttings of his trees all around the world. Uh, University of California, Davis was one of the places that received the cuttings. Um, planted at the Wolfskill Ranch in the 1980s. So in 1987, they had the first taste test between the Russian collection from Dr. Levin and the ones that are, were grown in America. And the Russian ones took the top seven spots. So Dr. Levin had done a really good job collecting the best um, pomegranates of the world. Um, there's a couple at the very top of the list that always seem to win the taste test, and those are Parfionka, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, and Ariana. Both these have large fruit, uh, red skin on the fruit, fairly red skin. Uh, the arrows are dark red. The seeds are really small and soft, so you don't really notice the seeds, and they both are sweeter than wonderful, but still have a good bite to them. So Parfionk and Ariana usually win the taste test when they run those. Um, a few years ago, they had a taste test in Florida, and they brought in a, f a number of uh, fig uh, pomegranates from California just to compare with the Florida varieties. Florida took, California took the top three spots with these varieties, with the, with the Russian variety. So apparently they are the best tasting pomegranates around. But Parfionk and Ariana, uh, both are top rated, small soft seeds. They said Parfionk, uh, if you want to give any description to it, like fine red wine, Ariana, uh, a little bit tartar maybe. For people who like the tartness of Wonderful, RNL might be better for them, but they're either one of these two usually win the taste test. Third place is usually Dysarskii. Uh oh, I'm 
so I can't remember that exact spelling. Uh, this one won third place in Florida, and I've eaten these, and I've thought this is uniquely good. It's a little different than the rest. So the description are in the literature, Dave Wilson's catalog, says it's like the best lemonade. So a couple years ago when we had ripe fruit on one of our trees, a customer asked me, what does that mean? It's a pomegranate. So we cut one open. Uh, it's a little bit lighter colored skin, kind of a salmon colored skin, but the uh, arrows are still fairly dark red. So we ate it, and it was mildly sweet until you swallowed the juice. And it, it does the same thing lemonade does. It kind of catches you in the throat with that finishing astringency. We thought, boy, this is really good. So that one's good, too. We li I like that one a lot. Uh, now, unfortunately, Dave Wilson stopped propagating it. So I guess because these two were their top sellers, so... They so we have to. I have a couple big ones from last year. Some trees, you know, when we get the trees in, we get them in these little tiny pots that are, um, say, eight inches high by four inches wide, and the trees are maybe a foot and a half tall when we get them. And within one year, um, I have some in 15 gallons that they would plant out over six feet. So that's how big they grew within one year. Um, all the pomegranates grow that big within one year. So uh, this one, um, we have to start our own cuttings. We, we took some cuttings this last winter, but we'll see. And they have another one that they stopped propagating, too, called Sira Nevii. Something like that. That's also a good one, and we're propagating that one, too. So anyway, those are some of the Russian names out there um, that are really good, but the top two are supposed to be the best two. Oh, another one, uh, Dessertney, we have this one, Dessert, and Dave Wilson's still propagating that, and all that means in Russian is dessert, it's a very mildly sweet one, so if you like them sweeter, Dessertney, they said has the tartness, say, of orange juice, so it's quite, quite pleasant to eat that one. So I believe these are your top five pomegranates of the world. Um, I might be wrong on that, but these are the top, at the, at the top of the list anyway. Now there's a few other pomegranates that are being grown a lot in the U.S. One is called Austin. It was brought from Syria to Austin, Texas. This is a hard seed. I only have a few of them left, and we are propagating it also ourselves because L.A. Cook was propagating this one. They went out of business last year. So the Austin pomegranate is a hard seed. They said in most areas of the United States, especially the central uh, um, area of the country, it's too cold to grow. So the Russian ones are being grown at the very southern part of Russia, just above Turkey, where the climate is more like Oregon, I would say, or... And it's not as cold in the winter there. And apparently the soft seeded varieties can't take extreme cold. So the hard seeded ones you can grow in Kansas or Missouri where it drops, I don't know, where, how cold does it drop there, negative 20? I don't know my climate zones that well in that part of the country, but they can't grow these. They grow Austin. They said this one will take the cold. It's a hard seed. Plus, the hard seed ones are better for juicing. If you're juicing the soft seed ones, they get all squishy and get into the juice. Whereas the hard seed ones are easier to juice. And they said Austin of the hard seed varieties, that appears to be the best tasting and best qualities of it. So we'll see. I, I haven't eaten Austin yet. We keep selling them before they fruit. The average orchard, they're probably kept around 10 to 12 foot. Now, the thing about pomegranates that's interesting is they bear on new growth. So you don't have to be as careful in the winter how you prune it, although it's still the thicker the branch, the better the chance of getting fruit. But you don't have to watch the pruning that well, that that much. My dad used to cut his down to three feet every winter. He used to have a wonderful, he used to cut it down to three feet every winter. And it would just grow back up to maybe five and flower and things like that. Never made very good fruit at that height. 
but apparently they, you can prune them freely. And I like to keep mine pruned at around eight foot in the winter, you know, cut it back down to eight foot in the winter and thin it out a bit. And generally with pomegranates, um, the orchards work with between five and eight trunks. Well, one, one to eight trunks. So some orchards, they only like one trunk. Some, they'll take up to eight of them. But if you get too many, so pomegranates, unfortunately, when they're young, are like olive trees. They look like a bush. They're just making hundreds of little stems come out of the dirt. You don't want all that little stuff because none of it makes really good fruit. So you got to thin out a lot of that, get down to, you know, eight, eight, I would say eight stems or less like the orchards do. And even one is fine. They stop making a lot of those little things as they mature. But for the first five to ten years, they make a lot of stems out of the ground. Oh, more sun, better, better fruit production, better flavor. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of shady areas around some of my pomegranate trees. They don't do very well. Now they're not 100% self-fertile, so any pomegranate farm will have more than one variety in there, one more than one cultivar in there. Um, I mean, most people get enough with just one tree, but if you want to get the full amount of fruit they can make, have two different kinds. Two varieties. Right two different varieties around. Most of them ripen in the fall. I mean, some ripen early. My Eversweet used to ripen in August. Uh, Wonderful usually ripens more like October, November. Um, the majority of the Russian ones, September, October. This is a Parfionka, one of the few I have that looks like it's got a definite fruit the very first year. So a lot of it seems to be, the, on a, especially on young trees, the heat of the spring, the, more, the warmer it is uh, in the spring, the more fruit they can grow that first year. Because 2014, that was a spring with no clouds. It was like 80, 90 degrees every day in the spring. Almost every tree we had, even though they were only like two foot tall, had fruit on them. The next year was one of the, I think it was 2015, was one of the cloudiest springs you've ever seen. Only two of our trees had any fruit at all. So it's that dramatic when we have sun versus no sun. So, you know, if you're going to grow pomegranates for a living, don't grow them in Orange County. <laughs> grow, grow them in Riverside. Uh, you see them out in Paris, uh, Menifee. That's where pomegranate orchards belong, more in the hotter summer climates. They don't seem to have that many other requirements. And what we did notice in our yard, too, uh, is that they can handle standing water, which surprised the heck out of me. So uh, in my own my last house I lived in, we had really clay soil. I mean, it's real bad clay. And where I put the pomegranates, this is, uh, I think, El Nino 96, maybe 97. They were sitting in water for three months. The water just wouldn't drain from my yard. They had a perfect crop. <laughs> They did really well. Now with pomegranates, and commercially they always say back off in the watering as the fruit's ripening also split it. Well, I would tell you the opposite. Keep the watering heavily so you don't split your fruit. Because what happens with pomegranates, this with, as with any fruit, if the tree is dry, the tree takes water out of the fruit, the fruit shrinks. And then you water and expands. And if, when it's expanding, it can expand a lot faster and it shrinks and it often splits it open. Well, if you um, let your tree dry out and the fruit shrinks, you can't control the rain. If you get a rainstorm on them, they all pop open and you lose your entire crop. So it's better to keep them on the wet side so they don't shrink. That's the strategy we do with uh, navel oranges because navel oranges split open too. If they ever get dry, you can lose every single one when you water it. They just all split open. So keep them wet and then they won't split on you. Don't let them dry out. Um, we're seeing a new bug on them the last five years. Something is, is, is making the leaves warp on us. Um, no one's doing any research on it because it doesn't seem to hurt the crop. But a lot of the new leaves in the spring and summer get this curling going on where the leaves just kind of curl like this. Whoop. And they get wavy edges too. We think it's a thrip. 
might be the chili thrip, maybe some other kind of thrip that's coming here that's uh, going after the young leaves, but it doesn't kill them, and it doesn't seem to hurt the fruiting at all, so we're, no one's controlling it. Uh, it's just more or less an aesthetic problem at this point. So, Otherwise, we don't seem to get, you know, the, again, if you have ants, watch for scale insects. Um, now, there's one other pomegranate we do grow that may be of note. And all I have in the nursery right now are this big, this is one called, we call it Aran, E-R-I-N. So this is a tropical pomegranate. So it's from the southern, from the pomegranates that evolved in southern India, not northern India. Um, my neighbor travels all around the world. My former neighbor travels all around the world, and he was eating a pomegranate in Singapore one year. Brought the seeds home with him because they're very soft-seeded. Uh, he planted them in his yard, got this tree that's about eight by eight fruits and flowers year round. So it's got regular size fruit, and normally about like that, just like you see normal, well, maybe a little smaller and wonderful. Uh, kind of a salmon pink skin, red, light red arrows, soft seeds, sweet. Flowers year round, fruits year round. It is unique. I'm sure if you went to the tropics, you'd find more of them, but I don't know where to get anymore, so we're propagating this tree. The problem with evergreen pomegranates is they're really difficult to propagate, whereas the ones that go to sleep in the morning, you just take a branch, one-year-old branch, pretty thick, pencil thick, stick it in the dirt, darn thing grows. Uh, these don't go to sleep, and we tried taking cuttings of them. It's like... Uh, one out of 20 makes it. It's like it's really difficult to propagate, so we charge up to kazoo for them. I'm not selling them this size. They're just too young yet. In five gallon, we've been selling for about $100. But uh, they are gorgeous. Bloom year-round with the orange flowers. Fruit year-round. Uh, Soft-seeded, hard to beat. Um, a couple years ago, I asked Dave Wilson if they would try to propagate it for me. They said, no, it's too difficult on the evergreen ones. But this year, Tom Spellman was just in on, um, on Wednesday, and he says, we'll do it. We'll try it. So hopefully they'll get it up in production, because I, I think it's going to be just an incredibly nice tree to have in the front yard that flowers year-round, fruits year-round, um, with good-tasting fruit. Um, he admits that, a few years ago, they weren't going to propagate any more pomegranates because they had too many in their collection that they were growing. But he says recently they threw away half of them. So now they have room to propagate some other varieties. So uh, we'll see if they can, if they, if he likes it, see how he does with that one. We might see more of that one around. So that was uh, the Aaron pomegranate. So we'll see if that becomes famous now. You know, if you lived in Riverside or inland any farther than that, it would probably be deciduous. So the tropical pomegranates will lose their leaves in cold, colder areas. Than that. In the 20 years we've seen it here, we have not seen it drop leaves in the winter. Uh, it hasn't gotten cold enough here to do it. But uh, they do say if you take them to any eastern part of the United States, they will, they'll just drop their leaves and go to sleep. So... So that one may be, become a, a good pomegranate for us. We'll see. Any other questions? Yes. What causes flower uh, Non-pollination. And a lot of the flowers, apparently, they make flowers in clusters. And some of the flowers are mostly male. So a lot of times the big flower in the middle is more of a female, and the small flowers on both sides are more male flowers. But I don't know. I haven't studied that enough. But when our customer was saying he was looking at the flowers carefully, and the side ones he thought were male, more male. I've got some that are just individual flowers, and they're here one day, and the next day they're gone. At first, I thought it was maybe the garden was running into it. But I've noticed when he hasn't been around, I was watching and it just all started dropping out. Well, one of the problems we have, too, sometimes, yeah, sometimes the birds mistake flower buds for fruit, and they destroy them. I mean, this year at our growing ground, almost every peach blossom got 
knocked off before it was before they even bloomed because the squirrels and the birds were really really hungry. <laughs> so it's possible. Well, again, we think the cool spring temperatures don't help, uh, and then certainly uh, if, if they don't get adequate water, that can make them drop too. Um, now, my neighbor who grows the Aaron, since they get fruit right around, they get, sometimes get rats here around, they cover their fruit, at least the top half of it, with aluminum foil. They said they don't, don't touch the ones in aluminum foil. So that's one other way of doing it. Um, that might be a lot of work on a fig tree, <laughs> but that that might work too. Foil on them. Now you know Sunset Magazine uh, last week I mentioned in the apple class that Sunset Magazine recommended putting apples into Ziploc bags, and they said they tasted better, looked better, and had no you know no pecks or anything from birds or anything in the Ziploc bags. I don't know if that'll work on pomegranates. It might, but uh, that's an interesting way to do it. <laughs> Okay, um, so our pomegranate trees are located on the, off that corner of the building, although I do have a few 15 gallons out where our figs are out here. <clears throat> so we have most of our figs either on the table in front of our greenhouse or off to the side. And that's our class. All right. Thank you. Thank you.